This is John chapter 12 in Jesus' ministry. This is toward the end of his ministry, and it's uh, shortly after that Lazarus has been raised from the dead. So verse 12, on the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. So here is this procession that goes into Jerusalem, and the people are lined up along the roadside here, and they're taking these branches off these palm trees, and Jesus is riding, and he's riding on this uh, colt and this young ass, and they're shouting out this word, Hosanna, and that word means to save. So Jesus had the message that could bring salvation to people's minds, and in the Old Testament, there was some words given to them about cutting these branches off of goodly trees, and it was a picture of worship. And so that's what Jesus taught people to do, was to be able to worship God, and the message that he taught would bring this salvation. So that's what they're saying, blessed is the king of Israel. The king is the one that, that gives people the law, and it was Christ that taught God's law to people, the spiritual law of God. And he came in the name of God, in the name of the Lord, that his name was Jesus as a picture of God's spiritual family name, as it's mentioned in the book of Ephesians, where Paul said, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So God has this family name, and that's what the people are saying here, that it, he was blessed and that he was their king, their seed sower. So this fact that he was sitting on this young ass was a fulfillment of a prophecy that's back in the Old Testament where it says, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. So it says in verse 16 that these things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. So this was an after-the-fact revelation to the disciples that they realized that all these things that were prophesied about Jesus were coming to pass. And this scripture in the Old Testament about the daughter of Zion, this was the Jewish people. The daughter always pictures the substance side of God, the female spirit side of God. And that was what people's faith, their substance was waiting for, was their king, their Messiah, to come to be able to save them. And, and this was fulfillment of that Old Testament scripture. And now the disciples, after Jesus is glorified, after his resurrection, then they understand that this very thing that happened here was the fulfillment of those Old Testament scriptures. Verse 17, The people therefore that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for they had heard that he had done this miracle. So this word was getting out, and there were witnesses to this resurrection of Lazarus when he was in this grave for four days, and Jesus raised him. These people spread this word around, and because of this, there were a lot of people that came to meet Jesus and because they'd heard about this particular miracle. Verse 19, The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. So here is these rulers of the Jewish religion, these Pharisees, that they see that their plans to, they had put out uh, threats against Jesus. They had uh, warned people that if they accepted him that they would be thrown out of the synagogue and they're not getting anywhere. They says we're not prevailing because all these people are following after Jesus. And so they're concerned because they think that they're going to lose their positions, they're going to lose their connection with the Romans, and there's a lot of fear working in these Pharisees. So their motive here is to try to get rid of Jesus. Verse 20, And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. So these Greeks were ones that the Jews had gone down and, and proselytized, had sent out missionaries to these Greek areas, and these people have come up to this feast to worship. Verse 21, The same came, therefore, to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. So these Greeks, they wanted to meet Jesus. They wanted to see what these words were that they'd heard about this man. And so they go to one of the disciples here, Andrew, and Andrew goes over to Philip, and they go and they tell Jesus. Well, at this time, Jesus doesn't go over there and meet with them. It doesn't say that. But Jesus does have some words to speak here. 
and verse 23, And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. So it's going to be a different work that's going on now. It's not the work of teaching and giving people seeds to give them understanding about the kingdom of God. The work that is coming for Jesus is the fact that he's going to become a sacrifice and he's going to be crucified. And so that's the work in which he's going to be glorified. He's going to receive this uh, glorified body and go back to the dimension that God exists in. So he doesn't change what he's doing here. And verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. So here is a, another little story that kind of a parable type illustration that Jesus gives. And this is like a kernel of wheat. And the illustration would be if you took a kernel of wheat and just put it on a shelf in a jar somewhere, it wouldn't do anything. But if you put it in the ground, then that kernel will, the outside will die and the life that's in that seed will bring forth and it'll produce many more seeds of wheat. And so he was giving an illustration that there is something that has to happen in our lives. And that is that we have grown up and we've gotten ideas that are wrong, uh, ideas about God in our mind that's been taught to us that may not be correct. We've gotten hurtful thoughts, evil thoughts within our mind, all kinds of things in our mind that are that are evil. They're, they're no good. And those things have to die. And what the scriptures calls that is our old man. And our old man has to be crucified. It has to die. And then it says that we can resurrect. That's called our new man. So if we allow this process to happen, just like this picture of this seed that dies, then something alive comes forth and brings forth much fruit. If we allow God to show us what our problems are and gives us the power to get rid of them, then there's this new man, this new creation that God can grow within our mind. And then as the fruit that comes forth would be like it tells us in the book of Galatians that the fruits of the Spirit are love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. So these are all these good things of God that can start to grow within our mind that we've been robbed of because of this old man that gets within our lives. So this is this illustration that Jesus gives, and this would be the answer for the Greeks if they want to see Jesus. This is the way they're going to see him. This is the way they're going to, to see means to understand. The way they're going to understand Jesus is to allow this process to happen in their lives. Verse 25, he that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. So if you love this old man life, this lesser death of life, if that's where your loyalties lie, if that's where your desires are, then that life is non-eternal at some point that life will be gone. So you have to hate this lesser death where all this evil is at within your mind. And if you do that, then you can keep your life and get eternal life because that will be the new man that will grow within your mind, bring forth this fruit. And this is God's life. And that kind of life is eternal. It doesn't go out of existence. Verse 26, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. So here is, again, the answer for the Greeks. If they want to serve Christ, if they want to be able to have what he has within his mind, understand him, and be able to serve that out to other people, then they're going to have to follow the example. And the example was that Christ did not do his own will. He laid down his life, and so he could do God's will. And that's where he was at, was in a depth of spirit, where God could communicate with him, and anything God would have him want done on this earth then Christ's mind was open to receive those commandments and he could do it and he says if you want to be where I am then you're going to have to go through this process of crucifixion let this wheat fall on the ground let this old man be revealed to you crucify it and then you can bring forth this new life and you'll be in the same depth I'm in you'll be able to honor God be able to listen to God and it says that him will my father honor because God has something there to relate to. He has something that if a person goes through this process and it's like what Paul said in the book of Galatians. He says I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live and yet it's not I but it's Christ that liveth in me and the life that I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul wasn't naturally crucified with Christ but spiritually he had gone through this same process in his life he recognized that as a young Jewish person, he was a hot 
head. He was angry at people that did things that he didn't like, and and when he heard about these Christians out here teaching something different than what the Jews were taught, he went out and persecuted them. But he did it through ignorance. And so he got rid of some of that, that anger and hatred that he carried around in his life, and so he was crucified with Christ. He got Christ's thoughts within his mind, and it was no longer him, his old man that was living. That corn of wheat, <laughs> that outside shell perished, and he was bringing forth these fruits to God. And so because of this process that he uh, went through in his life, he could have Christ in him. And that's the hope of glory. That's the hope of letting God work through us in our lives. Verse 27. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. So this wasn't something that Jesus looked forward to. He knew through the Old Testament scriptures what was going to happen to him, and this was a troubling thing to have to face this to go to his death and know the suffering that he was going to go through. But he says, what should I say about this? Father, save me from this hour? Well, that wasn't what he was going to ask God to do because he says this is the reason that I was sent. And this is part of the work that he did. The major part of the work that he did was to get this small group of disciples and get their minds prepared to carry this message of salvation out to the rest of the world. But then there was also this part of the work that he had to do to become a sacrifice for sin to make this depth of spirit available so the power would be there to go with these seeds that he had put within people's minds and they would be able to overcome evil in their life. So this was all part of the work that he had to do and there was uh, no reason for him to ask God to change it. This had to be done. 28. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Amen. So, you know, he, he says this out loud. He said, thy name. And that is, it had already happened in his life. That name within his mind had been glorified. So he was wanting this name that he had placed within the apostles' mind. They were part of God's family now. He was wanting God to work through that, that name. And there came this voice out of heaven. And again, this is proof that Christ had this power within him. You know, how often do you hear a voice come out of the sky? And the voice said, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. So every time that somebody would go through this process, like Paul and the different ones that got this name within him, that God could work through that. And that was Christ, that name, Jesus, being glorified in whoever it was in. So God's promise was, I will glorify this name. And he did. There were many people that became part of God's family at this time when this depth was available. So here were people around in this area where this voice came in 29. It says, the people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. So they knew something was going on. They heard this voice, and some people thought, well, maybe it's just thunder. And others says, well, no, an angel spake. Well, either way you look at it, it's still a picture of God speaking because God thunders marvelously with his voice in the Old Testament. And out of the throne in Revelation proceeds thunders and lightning. So that's a picture of God speaking through people, speaking through entities. He had been speaking through Christ. He speaks through angels. And so this was the witness that God was uh, working through Christ, that this was proof that this power that Christ had, it was from God, and it would continue to grow within people's minds. Verse 30, Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. So Jesus said, I didn't need to hear this voice to know that God was working through me. I already knew that, but this was proof so that you would know that this power was working. Verse 31, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. So this judgment of the world, you know, a lot of people teach that there's some kind of a future judgment, but Jesus says now is a judgment of this world. Right now, where he was talking, he says this is going to cause this judgment to take place. And the judgment is that he was seeking words that would give people life, and they would make a choice whether they wanted to hear those words or not hear those words. And there's a place in the book of Acts where uh, Paul was preaching this, this same word out that Jesus was preaching, and he was preaching to a bunch of Jews, and they didn't want to hear it. And he says, seeing you put this word far from you, we're going to turn to the Gentiles, and you've judged yourselves unworthy of eternal life. So there was a judgment by their choice. That's the kind of judgment that Jesus was talking about. And he says, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. That prince of this world is Lucifer. And it's when this depth of spirit that Christ brought is available, and people can understand how evil works, that they can choose to not let that evil work anymore and have, actually have the power 
to get that out of their lives. That's how this prince is going to be cast out, and it's individually in each person's mind that they get the power to keep evil from working through their mind. Verse 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. In verse 33 it says, This he said signifying what death he should die. So he already knew that he was going to be killed, but this specifically says what kind of death he would die. And he was lifted up from the earth on a cross and crucified. But there's another picture here, and it's just like he had told earlier when he was with Nicodemus, that there was, there was this picture in the Old Testament that God gave, and the people had disobeyed God, and there was a plague in the camp, and Moses was told to put this brazen serpent on a pole and raise it up. And then people would look to that, then they would be healed of this plague of snakes that were biting them. And so this is the same type of thing. If we allow God to raise this Christ depth in our mind and we look to that, then we can be saved and we can be healed of all the evil that's happened. We've been bitten a lot of times by evil in our life. We can, we can be healed of that. And so that's what Jesus is saying. It, when this process gets on a roll, when people get this Christ in their mind, everybody that's hungry for this, they're going to be drawn to that. Just like Jesus said in another place, no man can come unto the Father except the Father draw them, and I'll raise them up in the last day. So a person that has this hunger for God, they see something deeper working in somebody, and they see this power working, and it's like a magnet, and they get drawn to that, and then they can start into this process, and you can let the old man die, and you can bring forth this fruit to God. Verse 34, the people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever, and how sayest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So the people are questioning what he just said because he's talking about his death, and yet in the law they have these different scriptures that talk about Christ abiding forever, that he's a priest for after the order of Melchizedek forever, and of his uh, kingdom there would be no end and so they're thinking you know how could this be the Messiah how could you be the Messiah if there's going to be an end you don't have any offspring to carry your name on and how is this kingdom going to go on well if we think in the natural we would be in the same boat they were in we wouldn't understand what he's talking about but this kingdom that has no end is this kingdom of heaven that Christ taught and it's not a physical kingdom he says the kingdom of God is within you so it's a condition within your mind, it's eternal, and there is no end to that. Eternity is forever, and that's the depth of spirit that Christ made available to people. And if we get that depth in our mind, then there is no end to that kingdom. So the apostles of the early church, their physical bodies died, but spiritually they existed forever. They're still in existence because they got the kingdom of heaven within their mind. Just because he was physically killed, that didn't mean there was an end of this depth of spirit that Christ brought because that death does abide forever. Verse 35. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. So he says, while the light is here, when the truth, the light is a picture of God's truth. And when that truth is available, find it and look for it and walk in it. Have your way of life in that truth because if there's darkness, then you can't tell where you're going. You don't know, just like in a natural, you stumble all over stuff. Well, if you don't have the truth, then you can't see where you're going. Spiritually, you're blind. And Jesus says, this depth of truth is here now, so get your way of life in it, and you're not going to be blind. You're going to be able to see your way to get to God, to get to this deeper depth. 36, while you have the light, believe in the light, that you may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. So while you have the light, while, you, while this truth is available, mix your faith with it, and it'll make you a child of light. Now, that's kind of a strange phrase, but it means that you'll be an offspring of this truth. You'll be spiritual children of God. We won't be children of the dark. That's what we have been. That's when we have this old man in us. We're, we're children of the darkness. What's been produced in our mind is an offspring of evil, but now we can become an offspring of truth. And so Jesus is not going to do much more teaching. It says that he spoke these words, and then he departed, and he hid himself from them. So it was, it was time for some quiet time with the disciples. It was going to be some tough times coming up, and his work of teaching the multitudes was about over here.